The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 5, Side 1. Lorenzo would not have been the full man that he was had he not enjoyed some humor with his philosophy, some doubt with his faith, some license with his loves. As his son would welcome jesters and smile at risque comedies at the papal court, so the banker prince of Florence invited to his friendship and his table Luigi Pulci and relished the rough satire of the Morgante Maggiore. That famous poem, so admired by Byron, was read aloud, canto by canto, to Lorenzo and his household guests. Luigi was a man of robust and uninhibited wit, who convulsed a palace and a nation by applying the language, idioms, and views of the bourgeoisie to the romances of chivalry. The legends of Charlemagne's adventures in France, Spain, and Palestine had entered Italy in the twelfth century or before, and had been spread through the peninsula by minstrels and improvisatori, to the delight of every class. But there has always been, in the common male of the species, a bluff and lusty self-ridiculing realism, accompanying and checking the romantic spirit given to literature and art by woman and youth. Pulci combined all these qualities and put together, from popular legends, from the manuscripts in the Laurentian library, and from the conversation at Lorenzo's table, an epic that laughs at the giants, demons, and battles of chivalric tales, and recounts, in sometimes serious, sometimes mocking verse, the adventure of the Christian knight Orlando and the Saracen giant who gives the poem half its name. Attacked by Orlando, Morgante saves himself by announcing his sudden conversion to Christianity. Orlando teaches in theology, explains to him that his two brothers, just slain, are now in hell as infidels, promises him heaven if he becomes a good Christian, but warns him that in heaven he will be required to look without pity upon his burning relatives. The doctors of our church, says the Christian knight, are agreed that if those who are glorified in heaven were to feel pity for their miserable kindred, who lie in such horrible confusion in hell, their beatitude would come to nothing. Morgante is not disturbed. You shall see, he assures Orlando, if I grieve for my brethren, and whether or no I submit to the will of God and behave myself like an angel, I will cut off the hands of my brothers and take the hands to these holy monks, that they may be sure that their enemies are dead. In the eighteenth canto, Pulci introduces another giant, Margute, a jolly thief and mild murderer, who ascribes to himself every vice but that of betraying a friend. To Morgante's question whether he believes in Christ or prefers Mohammed, Margute answers, I don't believe in black more than in blue, but in fat capons, boiled or maybe roasted. And I believe sometimes in butter, too, in beer and must, where Bob's a pippin toasted. But mostly to old wine my faith I pin, and hold him saved who firmly trusts therein. Faith, like the itch, is catching. Faith is as man gets it, this, that, or another. See then what sort of creed I'm bound to follow, for you must know a Greek nun was my mother, my sire at bruise amid the Turks, a mullah. Margute dies of laughter after rollicking through two cantos. Pulci wastes no tear over him, but pulls from his magic fancy a demon of the first order, Astarote, who rebelled with Lucifer. Summoned from hell by the sorcerer Malagigi to bring Rinaldo swiftly from Egypt to Roncesvalles, he accomplishes the matter deftly, and wins such affection from Rinaldo that the Christian knight proposes to beg God to free Astarote from hell. But the courteous devil is an excellent theologian, and points out that rebellion against infinite justice was an infinite crime requiring eternal punishment. Malagigi wonders why a god who foresaw everything, including Lucifer's disobedience and everlasting damnation, proceeded to create him. Astarote confesses that this is a mystery which even a wise devil cannot resolve. He was in truth a wise devil, for Pulci, writing in 1483, puts into his mouth an astonishing anticipation of Columbus. Referring to the old warning at the Pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar, Naples Ultra, go no further, Astarote says to Rinaldo, Know that this theory is false. His bark, the daring mariner, shall urge far o'er the western wave, a smooth and level plain, albeit the earth is fashioned like a wheel. Man was in ancient days of grosser mold, and Hercules might blush to learn how far beyond the limits he had vainly set the dullest sea-boat soon shall wing her way. Men shall descry another hemisphere. Since to one common center all things tend, so earth, by curious mystery divine, well-balanced, hangs amid the starry spheres. 
at our antipodes, our cities, states, and thronged empires, ne'er divined of yore. But see, the sun speeds on his western path to glad the nations with expected light. It was part of Pochi's method to introduce each canto, however full of buffoonery, with a pious invocation of God and the saints. The more profane the matter, the more solemn the prologue. The poem ends with a declaration of faith in the goodness of all religions, a proposition sure to offend every true believer. Now and then Pulci allows himself a timid heresy, as when he quotes Scripture to argue that Christ's foreknowledge did not equal that of God the Father, or when he allows himself to hope that all souls, even Lucifer, will in the end be saved. But like a good Florentine and the other members of Lorenzo's circle, he remained externally faithful to a church inextricably bound up with Italian life. Ecclesiastics were not deceived by his disobedience. When he died in 1484, his body was refused burial in consecrated ground. If Lorenzo's group could produce so varied a literature in one generation, we may reasonably suppose, and shall find, a like awakening in other cities, Milan, Ferrara, Naples, Rome. In the century between Cosimo's birth and Lorenzo's death, Italy had accomplished and transcended the first stage in her renaissance. She had rediscovered ancient Greece and Rome, had established the essentials of classical scholarship, and had made Latin again a language of masculine splendor and pithy force. But more, in the generation between Cosimo's death and Lorenzo's, Italy rediscovered her own language and soul, applied the new standards of diction and form to the vernacular, and composed poetry, classical in spirit, but indigenous and modern in tongue and thought, rooted in the affairs and problems of its own day, or in the scenes and persons of the countryside. And again, Italy in one generation, through Pulci, had lifted the humorous romance into literature, had prepared the way for Boyardo and Ariosto, had even anticipated Cervantes's smiles at chivalric fustian and pretense. The age of the scholars receded, imitation gave way to creation. Italian literature, which had languished after Petrarch's choice of Latin for his epic, was reborn. Soon the revival of antiquity would be almost forgotten in the exuberance of an Italian culture leading the world in letters and flooding it with art. 5. Architecture and Sculpture, The Age of Verrocchio Lorenzo continued enthusiastically the Medician tradition of supporting art. He was such an admirer of all the remains of antiquity, wrote his contemporary Valori, that there was nothing with which he was more delighted. Those who wished to oblige him were accustomed to collect, from every part of the world, medals, coins, statues, busts, and whatever else bore the stamp of ancient Greece or Rome. Uniting his architectural and sculptural collections with those left by Cosimo and Piero, he placed them in a garden between the Medici Palace and the Monastery of San Marco, and admitted to them all responsible scholars and visitors. To students who showed application and promise, among whom was the young Michelangelo, he gave a stipend for their maintenance and awards for special proficiency. Says Vasari, It is highly deserving of notice that all those who studied in the gardens of the Medici and were favored by Lorenzo, became excellent artists. This can only be ascribed to the exquisite judgment of this great patron, who could not merely distinguish men of genius, but had the will and power to reward them. The key event in the art history of Lorenzo's regime was the publication in 1486 of Vitruvius's treatise De Architectura, 1st century B.C., which Poggio had unearthed in the monastery of St. Gaul some seventy years before. Lorenzo succumbed completely to that rigid classic and used his influence to spread the style of imperial Rome. Perhaps in this matter he did as much harm as good, for he discouraged in architecture what he was fruitfully practicing in literature, the development of native forms. But his spirit was generous. Through his encouragement, and in many cases with his funds, Florence was now adorned with elegant civic buildings and private residences. He completed the Church of San Lorenzo and the Abbey at Fiesole, he engaged Giuliano de San Gallo to design a monastery outside the San Gallo gate that gave the architect his name. Giuliano built for him a stately villa at Poggio a Caiano, and so handsomely that Lorenzo recommended him when King Ferdinand of Naples asked him for an architect. How well such artists loved him appears in the subsequent generosity of Giuliano, who sent as presents to Lorenzo the gifts that Ferrante gave him, a bust of the Emperor Hadrian, a sleeping Cupid, and other ancient sculptures. Lorenzo added these to the collections in his garden, which were later to form the nucleus of the statuary in the Uffizi Gallery. 
Other rich men rivaled, some surpassed him in the splendor of their residences. About 1489, Benedetto da Maiano built for Filippo Strozzi the Elder the most perfect embodiment of that Tuscan style of architecture which Brunellesco had developed in the Pitti Palace. Internal splendor and luxury behind a massive front of rustic or unfinished stone blocks. It was begun with careful astrological timing, with religious services in several churches, and with a conciliatory distribution of alms. After Benedetto's death in 1497, Simone Palaiuolo completed the building and added a fine cornice on the model of one that he had seen in Rome. How excellent the interior of these seeming prisons might be, we may surmise from their magnificent fireplaces, mighty marble entablatures supported by floral-carved pillars and surmounted with reliefs. Meanwhile, the signory continued to improve its unique and beautiful home, the Palazzo Vecchio. Most of the architects were sculptors, too, for sculpture played the leading part in architectural ornament, carving cornices and moldings, pilasters and capitals, door jams and chimney pieces, wall reliefs, altars, choir stalls, pulpits, and baptismal fonts. Giuliano de Maiano carved the stalls in the sacristy of the cathedral and in the abbey at Fiesole. His brother Benedetto developed the art of intarsia and became so famous for it that King Matthias Corvinus of Hungary ordered from him two coffers of inlaid wood and invited him to his court. Benedetto went and had the coffers sent after him. When these arrived at Budapest and were unpacked in the presence of the king, the inlaid pieces fell out, the glue having been loosened by the damp sea air, and Benedetto, though he replaced the pieces successfully, took a distaste to marquetry and devoted himself thereafter to sculpture. There are few sculptured virgins lovelier than his enthroned Madonna, few busts that surpass his honest and revealing Filippo Strozzi, few tombs so fine as that of the same Strozzi in Santa Maria Novella, no pulpit more elegantly carved than that which Benedetto made for the church of Santa Croce, and few altars so near perfection as that of Santa Fina in the collegiate church of San Gimignano. Sculpture and architecture tended to run in families, the Della Robias, the Sangali, the Rossellini, the Palaiuoli. Antonio Palaiuoli, uncle of Simone, learned accuracy and delicacy of design as a goldsmith in the studio of his father, Jacopo. The bronze, silver, and gold products of Antonio made him the Cellini of his time and a favorite of Lorenzo, the churches, the signory, and the guilds. Noting how rarely such small objects retained the name of their maker and sharing the Renaissance mirage of immortal fame, Antonio turned to sculpture and cast in bronze two magnificent figures of Hercules, rivaling the strained power of Michelangelo's captives and the tortured passion of the Laocoon. Passing to painting, he told the story of Hercules in three murals for the Medici Palace, challenged Botticelli and Apollo and Daphne, and equaled the absurdity of a hundred artists in showing how calmly St. Sebastian could receive into his flawless body the arrows launched at him by leisurely bowmen. In his final years, Antonio returned to sculpture and cast for the old church of St. Peter in Rome two superb sepulchral monuments, of Sixtus IV and Innocent VIII, with a vigor of chiseling and a precision of anatomy again presaging Michelangelo. Mino da Fiesole was not so versatile nor so tempestuous. He was content to learn the sculptor's art from Desiderio de Settignano, and when his master died to carry on his tradition of smooth elegance. If we may believe Vasari, Mino was so affected by Desiderio's early death that he found no happiness in Florence and sought new scenes in Rome. There he made a name for himself with three masterpieces, tombs of Francesco Tornabuoni and Pope Paul II, and a marble tabernacle for Cardinal de Tudeville. His confidence and solvency restored, he returned to Florence and adorned with exquisite altars the churches of Sant'Ambrogio and Santa Croce and the baptistry. In the cathedral of his native Piesole, he set up in classical style an ornate tomb for Bishop Salutati, and for the abbey of Fiesole he molded a similar monument, more restrained in ornament, to commemorate the Count Ugo who had founded that monastery. The cathedral of Prato boasts a pulpit by him, and a dozen museums display one or more of the busts by which his patrons were less flattered than embalmed. The face of Niccolo Strozzi, swollen as with the mumps, the weak features of Piero the Gauti, the fine head of Dieti Salvi Neroni, a pretty relief of Marcus Aurelius as a youth, a splendid bust of St. John the Baptist in infancy, 
and several lovely reliefs of the Virgin and Child. Nearly all these works have the feminine grace that Mino had learned from Desiderio. They are pleasing, but not arresting or profound. They do not grip our interest as do the sculptures of Antonio Pagliuoli or Antonio Rossellino. Mino loved Desiderio too much. He could not turn his back upon his master's exemplars and seek in the merciless neutrality of nature the significant realities of life. Verrocchio, true eye, was brave enough to do this and produced two of the greatest sculptures of his time. Andrea di Michele Cione, for that was his real name, was a goldsmith, a sculptor, a bell caster, a painter, a geometrician, a musician. As a painter, his chief claim to fame lies in having taught and influenced Leonardo, Lorenzo de Credi, and Perugino. His own paintings are mostly stiff and dead. There are few Renaissance pictures more unpleasant than the famous baptism of Christ. The Baptist is a doer Puritan. Christ, presumably thirsty, looks like an old man, and the two angels at the left are effeminately insipid, including the one traditionally ascribed to Leonardo. But Tobias and the Three Angels is excellent. The central angel foreshadows the grace and mood of Botticelli, and the young Tobias is so fair that we must either attribute him to Leonardo or confess that da Vinci received more of his pictorial style from Verrocchio than we supposed. A drawing of a woman's head in Christchurch, Oxford, again suggests the vague and pensive ethereality of Leonardo's women, and Verrocchio's dark landscapes already feature the gloomy rocks and mystic streams of Leonardo's dreamy masterpieces. Probably there is mostly fable in Vasari's tale that when Verrocchio saw the angel that Leonardo had painted in the baptism of Christ, he resolved never to touch the brush again, because Leonardo, though so young, had so far surpassed him. But though Verrocchio continued to paint after the baptism, it is true that he gave most of his mature years to sculpture. He worked for a while with Donatello and Antonio Pagliuoli, learned something from each of them, and then developed his own style of stern and angular realism. He took his career in his hands by molding in terracotta an unflattering bust of Lorenzo, nose and bangs and worried brow. In any case, Il Magnifico was well pleased with two bronze reliefs of Alexander and Darius, made for him by Verrocchio. He sent them to Matthias Corvinus of Hungary and engaged the sculptor in 1472 to design in the church of San Lorenzo a tomb for his father Piero and his uncle Giovanni. Verrocchio carved the sarcophagus in porphyry and decorated it with bronze supports and wreaths in exquisite floral form. Four years later he cast a boyish David standing in calm pride over the severed head of Goliath. The signory liked it so much that it placed the statue at the head of the main stairway in the Palazzo Vecchio. In the same year it accepted from him a bronze boy holding a dolphin and used it as a fountain spout in the courtyard of the palace. At the height of his powers, Verrocchio designed and cast in bronze for a niche on the exterior of Or San Michele, a group of Christ and Doubting Thomas, this in 1483. The Christ is a figure of divine nobility. Thomas is portrayed with understanding sympathy. The hands are finished with a perfection seldom attained in statuary. The robes are a triumph of sculptural art. The whole group has a living and mobile reality. So obvious was Verrocchio's superiority in bronze that the Venetian Senate invited him in 1479 to come to Venice and cast a statue of Bartolomeo Colleone, the condottiere who had won so many victories for the island state. Andrea went, made a model for the horse, and was preparing to cast it in bronze when he learned that the Senate was considering the advisability of confining his commission to the horse and letting Villano of Padua make the man. Andrea, according to Vasari, broke the head and legs of his model and returned to Florence in a rage. The Senate warned him that if he ever put foot on Venetian soil again, he would lose his head in no figurative way. He replied that they should never expect him there, since senators were not as skillful as sculptors in replacing broken heads. The Senate thought better of the matter, restored the total commission to Verrocchio, and persuaded him to return at twice the original fee. He repaired the model of the horse and cast it successfully, but in the process he became overheated, caught a chill, and died within a few days at the age of fifty-six in 1488. In his last hours a rude crucifix was placed before him. He begged the attendants to take it away and bring him one by Donatello so that he might die as he had lived in the presence of beautiful things. The Venetian sculptor Alessandro Leopardi completed the great statue in so vivid a style, with such mastery of motion and command, that the Colleoni suffered no loss by Verrocchio's death. 
It was set up in 1496 in the Campo di San Zanipolo, the field of Saints John and Paul, and it struts there to this day the proudest and finest equestrian statue surviving from the Renaissance. 6. Painting 1. Ghirlandaio Verrocchio's thriving studio was characteristic of Renaissance Florence. It united all the arts in one workshop, sometimes in one man. In the same bottega, one artist might be designing a church or a palace, another might be carving or casting a statue, another sketching or painting a picture, another cutting or setting gems, another carving or inlaying ivory or wood or fusing or beating metal or fashioning floats and pennons for a festival procession. Men like Verrocchio, Leonardo, or Michelangelo could do any of these. Florence had many such studios, and art students went wild in the streets, or lived bohemianly in the tenements, or became rich men honored by popes and princes as inspired spirits beyond price and, like Cellini, above the law. More than any other city except Athens, Florence attached importance to art and artists, talked and fought about them, and told anecdotes about them, as we do now of actors and actresses. It was Renaissance Florence that formed the romantic concept of the genius, the man inspired by a divine spirit, the Latin genius, dwelling within him. It is worthy of note that Verrocchio's studio left no great sculptor, except one side of Leonardo, to carry on the master's excellence, but taught two painters of high degree, Leonardo and Perugino, and one of lesser but notable talent, Lorenzo di Credi. Painting was gradually ousting sculpture as the favorite art. Probably it was an advantage that the painters were uninstructed and uninhibited by the lost murals of antiquity. They knew that there had been such men as Apelles and Protogenes, but few of them saw even the Alexandrian or Pompeian remnants of ancient painting. In this art there was no revival of antiquity, and the continuity of the Middle Ages with the Renaissance was most visible. The line was devious but clear from the Byzantines to Duccio to Giotto to Fra Angelico to Leonardo to Raphael to Titian. So the painters, unlike the sculptors, had to forge through trial and error their own technology and style. Originality and experiment were forced upon them. They labored over the details of human, animal, and plant anatomy. They tried circular, triangular, or other schemes of composition. They explored the tricks of perspective and the illusions of chiaroscuro to give depth to their backgrounds and body to their figures. They scoured the streets for apostles and virgins and drew from models clothed or nude. They passed from fresco to tempera and back again, and appropriated the new techniques of oil painting introduced into northern Italy by Roger van der Weyden and Antonio de Messina. As their skill and courage grew, and their lay patrons multiplied, they added to the old religious subjects the stories of classic mythology and the pagan glories of the flesh. They took nature into the studio, or betook themselves to nature. Nothing human or natural seemed in their view alien to art. No face so ugly but art could reveal its illuminating significance. They recorded the world, and when war and politics had made Italy a prison and a ruin, the painters left behind them the line and color, the life and passion of the Renaissance. Formed by such studies, inheriting an ever richer tradition of methods, materials, and ideas, men of talent painted better now than men of genius had painted a century before. Benozzo Gozzoli, says Vasari in an ungracious moment, was not of great excellence, yet he distanced all the others of his age in his perseverance, for among the multitude of his works some could hardly help but be good. He began as a pupil of Fra Angelico, and followed him to Rome and Orvieto as assistant. Piero the Gauti recalled him to Florence and invited him to portray, on the walls of the chapel in the Medici Palace, the journey of the Magi from the east to Bethlehem. These frescoes are Benozzo's chef dœuvre a stately and yet lively procession of kings and knights in gorgeous robes, of squires, pages, angels, hunters, scholars, slaves, horses, leopards, dogs, and half a dozen Medici, and Benozzo himself, slyly introduced into the parade, and all against backgrounds and landscapes marvelous and picturesque. Flushed with triumph, Benozzo went to San Gimignano and decorated the choir of Sant'Agostino with seventeen scenes from the life of its patron saint. In the Campo Santo at Pisa, he labored for sixteen years, covering vast walls with twenty-one Old Testament scenes from Adam to the Queen of Sheba. Some, like the Tower of Babel, were among the major frescoes of the Renaissance. Benozzo deluded his excellence through eager haste. He drew carelessly, made many of his figures depressingly uniform, 
and crowded his pictures with a confusing multitude of persons and details. But he had in him the blood and joy of life. He loved its lusty panorama and the glory of the great. And the imperfections of his line are half forgotten in the splendor of his color and the enthusiasm of his fertility. The benign influence of Fra Angelico passed down to Alesso Baldovinetti and Cosimo Roselli, and through Alesso to one of the major painters of the Renaissance, Domenico Ghirlandaio. Domenico's father was a goldsmith who had received the nickname of Ghirlandaio from the gold and silver garlands that he had fashioned for the pretty heads of Florence. Under this father and Baldovinetti, Domenico studied with zest and zeal, spent many hours before the frescoes of Masaccio and the Carmine, learned by indefatigable practice the arts of perspective, foreshortening, modeling, and composition. He would draw everyone who passed the shop, says Vasari, making extraordinary likenesses after a fleeting view. He was barely twenty-one when he was charged to paint the story of Santa Fina in her chapel in the cathedral at San Gimignano. At thirty-one in 1480 he earned the title of master by four frescoes in the church and refectory of the Ognisanti in Florence, a St. Jerome, a Descent from the Cross, a Madonna della Misericordia, which included a portrait of the donor, Amerigo Vespucci, and a Last Supper that gave some hints to Leonardo. Summoned to Rome by Sixtus IV, he painted in the Sistine Chapel Christ calling Peter and Andrew from their nets, especially beautiful in its background of mountains, sea, and sky. During this stay in Rome, he studied and drew the arches, baths, columns, aqueducts, and amphitheaters of the ancient city, and with so practiced an eye that he was able to seize at once, without rule or compass, the just proportions of each part. A Florentine merchant in Rome, Francesco Tornabuoni, mourning his dead wife, employed Ghirlandaio to paint frescoes for her memorial in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, and Domenico succeeded so well that Tornabuoni sent him back to Florence armed with florins and a letter attesting to his excellence. The signory soon entrusted to him the decoration of the Sala del Orlogio in their palace. In the next four years, from 1481 to 1485, he painted scenes from the life of St. Francis in the Sassetti Chapel of Santa Trinita. All the progress of the painter's art, except the use of oil, was embodied in these frescoes. Harmonious composition, accurate line, gradations of light, perspective fidelity, realistic portraiture, of Lorenzo, Politian, Pulci, Palastrozzi, Francesco Sassetti, and at the same time the Angelesque tradition of ideality and piety. From the near perfection of the altarpiece, the adoration of the shepherds, there would be but a step of deeper imagination and subtler grace to Leonardo and Raphael. In 1485, Giovanni Tornabuoni, chief of the Medici Bank in Rome, offered Ghirlandaio twelve hundred ducats, or thirty thousand dollars, to paint a chapel in Santa Maria Novella, and promised him two hundred more if the work should prove fully satisfactory. Aided by several pupils, including Michelangelo, Ghirlandaio gave most of the following five years to this high moment of his career. On the ceiling he painted the four evangelists, on the walls St. Francis, Peter Martyr, John the Baptist, and scenes from the lives of Mary and Christ, from an Annunciation to a magnificent Coronation of the Virgin. Here again he delighted in contemporary portraits, the stately Ludovica Tornabuoni, fit to be a queen, the saucy beauty of Ginevra di Benci, the scholars Ficino, Politian, and Landino, the painters Baldovinetti, Minardi, and Ghirlandaio himself. When in 1490 the chapel was opened to the public, all the dignitaries and literati of Florence flocked to examine the paintings. The realistic portraits were the talk of the town, and Tornabuoni expressed himself as completely satisfied. Financially pressed at the time, he begged Domenico to forgive him the extra two hundred ducats. The artist replied that the satisfaction of his patron was more precious to him than any gold. He was a lovable character, so adored by his brothers that one of them, David, almost slew an abbot with an aged loaf of bread for bringing to Domenico and his aides food that David held unworthy of his brother's genius. Ghirlandaio opened his studio to all who cared to work or study there, making it a veritable school of art. He accepted all commissions, great or small, saying that none should be denied. He left the care of his household and finances to David, saying that he would not be content till he had painted the whole circuit of Florence's wall. He produced many mediocre paintings, and yet some incidental pieces of great charm, 
like the Louvre's delightful grandfather with the bulbous nose, and the lovely portrait of a woman in the Morgan Collection in New York, pictures full of the character that year by year records itself upon the human face. Great critics of unquestionable learning and repute yielded him only a minor rank, and it is true that he excelled rather in line than in color, that he painted too rapidly and crowded his pictures with irrelevant detail, and took a step backward, perhaps, in preferring tempera after Baldovinetti's experiments with oil. Even so, he brought the accumulated technology of his art to the highest point that it would reach in his country and his century, and he bequeathed to Florence and the world such treasures that criticism hangs its head in gratitude. 2. Botticelli Only one Florentine surpassed him in his generation. Sandro Botticelli was as different from Ghirlandaio as ethereal fancy from physical fact. Alessandro's father, Mariano Filippepi, unable to persuade the boy that life would be impossible without reading, writing, and arithmetic, apprenticed him to the goldsmith Botticelli, whose name, through the affection of the pupil or the whim of history, became permanently attached to Sandro's own. From this bottega the lad passed at sixteen to that of Fra Filippo Lippi, who came to love the restless and impetuous youth. Filippo's Filippino later painted Sandro as a sullen fellow with deep-set eyes, salient nose, sensual fleshy mouth, flowing locks, purple cap, red mantle, and green hose. Who would have guessed such a man from the delicate fantasies that Botticelli has left to the museums? Perhaps every artist must be a sensualist before he can paint ideally. He must know and love the body as the ultimate source and standard of the aesthetic sense. Vasari describes Sandro as a merry fellow who played pranks upon fellow artists and obtuse citizens. Doubtless, like all of us, he was many men, turned on one or another of his selves as occasion required, and kept his real self a frightened secret from the world. About 1465, Botticelli set up his own studio and soon received commissions from the Medici. It was apparently for Lorenzo's mother, Lucrezia Tornabuoni, that he painted Judith, and for Piero Gottoso, her husband, he made his Madonna of the Magnificat and his Adoration of the Magi, hymns in color to three Medici generations. In the Madonna, Botticelli pictured Lorenzo and Giuliano as boys of sixteen and twelve, holding a book upon which the Virgin, borrowed from Fra Lippo, writes her noble song of praise. In the Adoration, Cosimo kneels at Mary's feet, Piero kneels at a lower level before them, and Lorenzo, now seventeen, holds a sword in his hand as a sign that he has reached the age of legitimate killing. Lorenzo and Giuliano carried on Piero's patronage of Botticelli. His finest portraits are of Giuliano and Giuliano's beloved Simonetta Vispucci. He still painted religious pictures, like the powerful St. Augustine in the church of the Onisanti. But in this period, perhaps under the influence of Lorenzo's circle, he turned more and more to pagan subjects, usually from classical mythology, and favoring the nude. Vasari reports that in many houses Botticelli painted plenty of naked women, and accuses him of serious disorders in his living. The humanists and animal spirits had won Sandro for a time to an Epicurean philosophy. It was apparently for Lorenzo and Giuliano that he painted in 1480 the birth of Venus. A demure nude rises from a golden shell in the sea, using her long blonde tresses as the only fig leaf at hand. On her right, winged zephyrs blow her to the shore. On her left, a pretty maid, possibly Simonetta, clad in a gown of flowered white, offers the goddess a mantle to enhance her loveliness. The painting is a masterpiece of grace, in which design and composition are everything, color is subordinate, Realism is ignored, and everything is directed to evoking an ethereal fancy through the flowing rhythm of the line. Botticelli had taken the theme from a passage in Politian's La Giostra. From a description in the same poem of Giuliano's victories in jousts and love, the artist took his second pagan picture, Mars and Venus. Here Venus is clothed, and may again be Simonetta. Mars lies exhausted and asleep, no rude warrior but a youth of unblemished flesh, who might almost be mistaken for another Aphrodite. Finally, in his spring, Primavera, Botticelli expressed the mood of Lorenzo's hymn to Bacchus, Who would be happy, let him be. The auxiliary lady of the birth reappears with her flowing robe and pretty feet. At the left, Giuliano, possibly, plucks an apple from a tree to give to one of the three graces standing half-nude beside him. On the right, a lusty male seizes a maiden dressed in a little mist. 
Simonetta presides modestly over the scene, and in the air above her Cupid shoots his quite superfluous darts. These three pictures symbolized many things, for Botticelli loved to allegorize, but perhaps without his realizing it, they represented also the victory of the humanists in art. The Church would now, for half a century, from 1480 to 1534, struggle to regain her dominance over pictorial themes. As if to meet the issue squarely, Sixtus IV called Botticelli to Rome in 1481 and commissioned him to paint three frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. They are not among his masterpieces. He was in no mood for piety. But when he returned to Florence in 1485, he found the city astir with Savonarola's sermons and went to hear him. He was deeply moved. He had always harbored a strain of austerity, and whatever skepticism he might have caught from Lorenzo, Pulci, and Politian had been lost in the secret well of his youthful faith. Now the fiery preacher at San Marcos pressed upon him and Florence the awful implications of that faith. God had allowed himself to be insulted, scourged, and crucified to redeem mankind from the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin. Only a life of virtue or sincere repentance could win some grace from that sacrifice of God to God and so escape eternal hell. It was about this time that Botticelli illustrated Dante's Divine Comedy. He turned his art again to the service of religion and told once more the marvelous story of Mary and Christ. For the Church of St. Barnabas he painted a masterly group of the Virgin enthroned with divers saints. She was still the tender and lovely maiden whom he had drawn in Fra Lippo's studio. Soon afterward he painted the Madonna of the Pomegranate, the Virgin surrounded by singing cherubim, the child holding in his hand the fruit, whose innumerable seeds symbolized the dissemination of the Christian faith. In 1490 he recapitulated the epic of the Divine Mother in two pictures, the Annunciation and the Coronation, but he was aging now and had lost the fresh clarity and grace of his art. In 1498 Savonarola was hanged and burned. Botticelli was horrified at this most distinguished murder of the Renaissance. Perhaps it was shortly after that tragedy that he painted his complex symbolism, Calumny. Against a background of classic archways and distant sea, three women... Fraud, deception, calumny, led by a ragged male, envy, drag a nude victim by the hair to a tribunal where a judge with the long ears of an ass, advised by females personifying suspicion and ignorance, prepares to yield to the fury and bloodthirst of the crowd and condemn the fallen man, while at the left, remorse, garbed in black, looks in sorrow upon naked truth, Botticelli's Venus once more, clad in the same reptilian hair. Was the victim intended to represent Savonarola? Perhaps, though the nudes might have startled the monk. The Nativity in the National Gallery at London is Botticelli's final masterpiece, confused but colorful, and capturing for the last time his rhythmic grace. Here all seems to breathe a heavenly happiness. The ladies of the spring return as winged angels, hailing the miraculous and saving birth, and dancing precariously on a bough suspended in space. But on the picture Botticelli wrote in Greek these words, savoring of Savonarola, and recalling the Middle Ages in the height of the Renaissance. This picture I, Alessandro, painted at the end of the year 1500 in the troubles of Italy during the fulfillment of the eleventh chapter of St. John in the second woe of the Apocalypse, in the loosing of the devil for three years and a half. Later he shall be chained according to the twelfth of St. John, and we shall see him trodden down as in this picture. After 1500 we have no paintings from his hand. He was only 56 and might have had some art left in him, but he yielded place to Leonardo and Michelangelo and lapsed into a morose poverty. The Medici who had been his mainstay gave him charity, but they themselves were in a fallen state. He died alone and infirm, aged 66, while the forgetful world hurried on. Among his pupils was his teacher's son, Filippino Lippi, this love child was loved by all who knew him, a man gentle, affable, modest, courteous, whose excellence was such, says Vasari, that he obliterated the stain of his birth, if any there be. Under his father's tutelage and Sandro's, he learned the painter's art so rapidly that already at twenty-three he produced in The Vision of St. Bernard a portrait that in Vasari's judgment lacked only speech. When the Carmelite monks decided to complete the frescoes begun in their Brancacci chapel sixty years before, they awarded the commission to Filippino, still but twenty-seven. The result did not equal Masaccio, but in St. Paul addressing St. Peter in prison, Filippino achieved a memorable figure of simple dignity and quiet power. 
In 1489, at Lorenzo's suggestion, Cardinal Carafa called him to Rome to decorate a chapel in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva with scenes from the life of St. Thomas Aquinas. In the main fresco, the artist, perhaps recalling a similar picture by Andrea da Firenze a century before, showed the philosopher in triumph with Arius, Averroes, and other heretics at his feet. Meanwhile, in the universities of Bologna and Padua, the doctrines of Averroes were gaining ground over the Orthodox faith. Back in Florence, in the chapel of Filippo Strozzi in Santa Maria Novella, Filippino recorded the careers of the apostles Philip and John in frescoes so realistic that legend told how a boy tried to hide a secret treasure in a hole that Filippino had represented in a pictured wall. Interrupting this series for a time and replacing the dilatory Leonardo, he painted an altarpiece for the monks of Scopetto. He chose the old subject of the Magi adoring the child, but enlivened it with Moors, Indians, and many Medici. One of these last, serving as an astrologer with a quadrant in his hands, is among the most human and humorous portraits of the Renaissance. Finally, in 1498, as if to say that his father's sins had been forgiven, Filippino was invited to Prato to paint a Madonna. Vasari praised it, the Second World War destroyed it. He settled down to marriage at forty, and knew for a few years the joys and tribulations of parentage. Suddenly, at forty-seven, he died of so simple an ailment as quincy sore throat. This in 1505. 7. Lorenzo Passes Lorenzo himself was not among the few who in those centuries reached old age. Like his father, he suffered from arthritis and gout, to which was added a stomach disorder that frequently caused him exhausting pain. He tried a dozen remedies and found nothing better than the passing alleviation given by warm mineral baths. For some time before his death, he perceived that he, who had preached the gospel of joy, had not much longer to live. His wife died in 1488, and though he had been unfaithful to her, he sincerely mourned her loss and missed her helping hand. She had given him a numerous progeny, of whom seven survived. He had sedulously supervised their education, and in his later years he labored to guide them into marriages that might redound to the happiness of Florence as well as their own. The oldest son, Piero, was affianced to an Orsini to win friends in Rome. The youngest, Giuliano, married a sister of the Duke of Savoy, received from Francis I the title of Duke of Namur, and so helped to build a bridge between Florence and France. Giovanni, the second son, was directed into an ecclesiastical career and took to it amiably. He pleased everyone by his good nature, good manners, and good Latin. Lorenzo persuaded Innocent VIII to violate all precedents by making him a cardinal at fourteen. The Pope yielded for the same reason that made most marriages of royalty, to bind one government to another in the amity of one blood. Lorenzo retired from active participation in the government of Florence, delegated more and more of his public and private business to his son Piero, and sought comfort in the peace of the countryside and the conversation of his friends. He excused himself in a characteristic letter. What can be more desirable to a well-regulated mind than the enjoyment of leisure with dignity? This is what all good men wish to obtain, but which great men alone accomplish. In the midst of public affairs we may indeed be allowed to look forward to a day of rest, but no rest should totally seclude us from an attention to the concerns of our country. I cannot deny that the path which it has been my lot to tread has been arduous and rugged, full of dangers and beset with treachery, but I console myself in having contributed to the welfare of my country, the prosperity of which may now rival that of any other state, however flourishing. Nor have I been inattentive to the interests and advancement of my own family, having always proposed to my imitation the example of my grandfather Cosmo, who watched over his public and private concerns with equal vigilance. Having now obtained the object of my cares, I trust I may be allowed to enjoy the sweets of leisure, to share the reputation of my fellow citizens, and to exult in the glory of my native place. But little time was left him to enjoy his unaccustomed peace. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.